Well, thank you, and uh, can I echo uh, what Hein has said, and uh, from the whole church, a very warm welcome to you as a family. We're so uh, pleased. I think, are you, are you translating, Luda? Uh, thank you so much, and we, we're, we're delighted that you're here, and thankful to God that you're safe, safely here. And, uh, and we're concerned to do whatever we can to help you at this time. And, um, and, so, uh, and so thank you so much for, for taking part. Thank you for taking part, singing and playing uh, this morning as well. Uh, thank you as well. I echo uh, Robert for taking the time and trouble and the interest to be here today. We do appreciate that. And thank you to all the church as well for pulling together. I mean, we've had to respond very quickly, um, almost day by day, uh, sometimes sooner than that, sometimes just hour by hour to changing situ circumstances. And, but thank you for all who've been involved in pulling together to be able to, to help in the way that we, we have. Well, we live in a troubled world, um, as we've heard this morning and we're well aware of. And it, it does our souls good to focus on Psalm 46, in which we are reminded that God is our refuge and strength as believers in times of trouble. So we, we, we learn, verses 1 to 3, that God is our, our refuge in what may happen. Uh, verses 4 to 7, God is our refuge in what does happen. And verses four, 8 to 11, in the closing verses, God is our refuge in what will happen. So in what may happen, what does happen, and what will happen. And if I were to try and summarize the message of this psalm in just a few words, then it would be in these words, be still, because God is still our refuge. Well, it was a, a joy to learn during the latter part of the week that Luda's family would be arriving. And so as a result of that, I've changed what I was going to preach and um, to, to, to say something that I think was more fitting, more appropriate. And so I want to share a shorter message than I gave it uh, that would normally be, and we'll share with you a message that I shared at the prayer meeting. So uh, those of you that were at the prayer meeting a few weeks ago, you'll have to forgive me for repeating this, but I would like to share what I think is a more appropriate word. Um, we, we thought about these words. Uh, those of us who were at the prayer meeting a few weeks ago, we thought about these words when the current crisis in Ukraine began. Um, be still because God is still our refuge. Now, the psalm begins with this. It almost sounds like a, a creed or confession of faith, doesn't it? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. And the people of God have found this to be so from past experience when they've been through times of trouble. That's what they're really saying, is that we have proven in experience that God is our refuge, that God is still our refuge. So that we're able then, the psalmist says, to look ahead and whatever comes to know that God will still be our refuge and strength, whatever unfolds, whatever happens. Therefore, he says, uh, it follows verse, verse 2, therefore, in view of the past, therefore we will not fear, even though the earth be removed and the mountains be carried into the midst of of the sea. So on the basis of our past experience, we will not fear the future because we know that God will be our refuge and strength. And there's a good biblical illustration of that in 1 Samuel 17. You remember when famously when David, the shepherd boy, goes out to fight Goliath. And you remember that King Saul looks at him and he says, but you're just a shepherd boy. I mean, how are you possibly going to defeat this Philistine giant. Uh, you're just a youth. He's a man of, he's been a man of war since his youth. And David gently rebukes King Saul and basically says, his answer essentially is, do you know what it is to stare into the eyes of a lion and rescue one of your father's sheep? Have you ever snatched a lamb from the mouth of a bear and got so close you could, you could smell its breath? And so he answers, David answers Saul, well, let me tell you that I've killed both lion and bear, and this Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. And what is more, the Lord who delivered me from the jaws of the lion and from the 
paws of the bear will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. Do you, do you get the picture? On the basis of the past, we can continue to trust God for the future. So if you want a New Testament example, then the age of the Apostle Paul is languishing in prison. He writes what really is his last will and testament in second letter, the second letter to Timothy. And uh, Paul knows that he is going to become a martyr for Christ. And so he writes his second letter to Timothy. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, he writes, as an old man now, he writes, at my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, probably Nero, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul is saying exactly the same thing. When the Apostle Paul was in prison in Philippi, you think of in Acts 16 when Paul and Silas are in prison at midnight. Their backs are bleeding, but they're singing praises to God. And they would have been, inevitably, they would have been singing Israel's songbook, which would have been the book of Psalms. And I kind of wondered to myself, was, were they singing Psalm 46? God, God is our strength and refuge. But as the psalmist looks to the future... He says, therefore, we will not fear, even in the worst possible circumstances, even though the earth be removed, even though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling. So he's talking about the kind of chaos that causes you to to question whether God really is in control, so that you wonder, well, where is God in this situation? It's the kind of thing that leads people to ask questions like, where was God in the tsunami? He's talking about things that ought not to happen. Uh, In fact, the words that he uses here, though the earth be removed, are the same words that elsewhere are used to describe the steadfast, enduring, remaining nature of of the earth, of the mountains. So that, for example, in, in Psalm 93... The Lord reigns, he's clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed. He has girded himself with strength. Surely the world is established so that it cannot be moved. And yet now he says, even if the earth is removed, we still will trust in God. He will still be our refuge and strength. If God is in control of everything that he's created, then the earth ought not to crumble. The mountains ought not to topple. The seas ought not to roar. Not if God is in control, and the psalmist or the sons of Korah who are writing this psalm, they look and they say, well, even then, even if these things happen, God will still be our refuge and strength. Now, why does the psalmist paint for us such an extreme picture? Well, he's doing so because there are times in our lives when we face extreme circumstances, don't we? There are times when things happen that ought not to happen. And happen very quickly. When things that ought not to happen, when a parent is, or when parents are bearing a child, you think it ought not to happen, it ought to be the other way around. You can apply this psalm physically, politically, personally. If you think of your worst fears, what is it that what is it that you fear more than anything else? Well, what he's really saying is, whatever your worst fears may be, God will still be your refuge and strength. So if a day comes when when I find myself or when we find ourselves in a care home, unable to recognize the faces of our nearest and dearest who come to visit, even then, God will still be your refuge and strength. That's the message of the psalm. We have to ask ourselves, why is it that God is our refuge and strength, even in the midst of chaotic circumstances? Well, the answer is here in the chorus that comes in both verse verse 7 and verse 11, the refrain. Verse 7 and verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. 
very simply, it means this. For one thing, it means that he is the God of all resources. He's the God of all resources. When God describes himself as the Lord of hosts, it can mean several things. You know, the description, Lord of hosts, the title for God, Lord of hosts, can mean um, several things in, in the Bible. So that, for example, the hosts can refer to the, the hosts of heaven, the stars. You know, he calls them all out. Isaiah says that he knows the, the name and the number of every star, of every planet. He is the one, God is the one, who has called all the stars and all the planets and all the solar systems and all the galaxies and everything into being. And those wonderful castaway, those throwaway words in Genesis 1, he made the stars also, by the way. He possesses the entire created order. He is the God who can say to Job, when Job is throwing question after question after question to God, and when Job finally gives up speaking and God says to him in Job 38, Job, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? So the hosts refers to planets and stars. They are his. But, you know, biblically, hosts can also refer to, to angelic beings, to angels and archangels. So much so that the Lord Jesus Christ can describe himself as the Lord of legions. Remember, Jesus said when they came out when Judas and uh, the uh, soldiers came out to arrest the Lord Jesus in, in Gethsemane. You remember the Lord Jesus, and you remember that Peter famously then struck off the ear of, uh, of one of the uh, soldiers' uh, servants, Sir Malchus. You remember that uh, Jesus said, put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he will provide, we, provide me with more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the scriptures be fulfilled that it must happen thus? In that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to take me? As I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, you did not seize me. What is Jesus saying there? Jesus is saying that he is the Lord of hosts. He's the Lord of legions. I could have called down more than 12, more than 12 legions of angels. A legion amounted to 6,000 Roman soldiers. So 12, that's 72,000. Jesus says I could call down more than 72,000 angels, which is quite an army. And he is saying he has infinitely more power at his disposal. He says, you come at me with sticks, and I could call down 72,000 angels to deliver me. But then hosts is used in the Bible not only to refer to the uh, planets, not only to refer to angelic beings, but hosts is used to refer to all the peoples of the earth, the hosts of people upon the earth. In other words, and I don't really don't want to trivialize or minimize the cost of this, but what we really believe is that ultimately with vast population movements around the world, please don't think God does not know that and that somehow God is excluded from that. He is, after all, the Lord of, of hosts who controls all things ultimately. So he is the God who possesses all the hosts of people, all the hosts of angels, all the hosts of stars and planets. He is the God of all resources. And he is with us as our refuge and strength. No wonder there is nothing to fear. But you see, uh, there's a second thing, and that is this. Secondly, he's not only the, the God of all um, of all the hosts, he's not the God of all resources, not just the God of all resources, but, but secondly, he is also the God of all grace. According to this refrain, this chorus, he's the God of all grace. Verse 7 and verse 11, the Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Now, when the psalmist calls him the God of Jacob, it's a shorthand way, biblically, of saying that he's the God of all grace. Remember that God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and, uh, and Jacob. And God dealt graciously. God promised that he would fulfill his covenant promises to Abraham down through the centuries. And, um, and you remember that Jacob, you, you remember what Jacob was like. 
Jacob was not really a very attractive character, was he? Um, he was a, a liar. He was a cheat. He, you remember that he cheated his uh, twin brother out of his birthright. He, he cheated his uncle Laban out of his, his livestock. Uh, he lied. He double-crossed his own family. Um, not really a very attractive character. And yet, God pursued him, loved him, despite his sin and his failure and his wickedness. He's the God of Jacob, the God of all grace, because God had set his love upon him and kept him, saved him and kept him. Now, I don't know about you, but personally, I find this incredibly comforting because I know what my own heart is like. And I think most of us do. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. He is the Lord, Yahweh. He's the one who made himself known to Moses at the burning bush in the wilderness, revealed himself to be the great I am who I am, who will be with you. So that even when we mess things up, even when we leave a trail of mess and, and, and leave things so badly, then he continues to love us and to change us more and more to become like him. He's the God of all resources. He's the God of all grace. And lastly, he's the God of all circumstances. See, verse 1, at the end of verse 1, it says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Actually, that word trouble is, in, is a plural, is in the, is in the uh, plural. Um, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in troubles. He's the God of all troubles who, in all circumstances. So in, verse 30, in Psalm 34, rather, Psalm 34, the psalmist can say, many are the afflictions of the righteous. It's not like, you know, God's, it's not as though the Lord says, well, I've helped you once before. You know, it's not like, um, you know, paying the AA or the, you know, the RAC or somebody. It's like two call outs and you've had your lot. Um, it, it's, God is consistently, continually. He is the God of unlimited resources with unlimited grace in unlimited circumstances. That's the message of the psalm. So that there is no situation so bad that he cannot or will not be with you, whatever your circumstance. And this is our God, our Heavenly Father. It's almost as though, and I'll end with this, it's almost as though the sons of Korah who wrote this psalm had been given a sneak preview of Romans chapter 8, at the end of Romans 8. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It doesn't mean that everything will work out perfectly. It doesn't mean that everything will go right, but he will be with us. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.